The third member of our panel is Dr Jeremy Moss. Dr Moss is the Director of the University of Melbourne's Social Justice Initiative. He's a preeminent pre researcher of political philosophy and moral theory, and he's particularly active in the areas of global equality and responsibility. Recently, he's been working on social justice in the face of climate change, and he brings a view here of the changes in society and its values into a changing future. Sure. Thank you, Henry. Uh, so what I wanted to briefly talk about then is the ethical dimension that I think is interwound, uh, interbound with um, climate change. And one of the things that I uh, greatly valued about reading Kurt's book and thinking about it later was the way in which it, it does, by looking at the, at the large scale and intergenerational and long-term effects of climate change, raise all sorts of, I think, fundamentally um, ethical questions that we really have to confront and think about in a serious way. Um, and from my point of view, thinking about climate change is fundamentally bound up with ethics because if there's not ethics involved, then we need to ask ourselves, well, in what sense is climate change um, a moral problem or not? For instance, if climate change isn't harming anyone, for instance, then um, it's really not an ethical problem and it's not the sort of problem that we should perhaps concern ourselves with uh, as much as we currently do. And we do concern ourselves with climate change because of the harms that it's going to have on us in the here and now, um, but also people in the future and indeed um, the environment, uh, both here and now and in the future. And when you start talking about the ways in which climate change is bad for people and it's bad for things, then you're suddenly in the domain of ethics. And you have to address issues like uh, who is going to be most disadvantaged by climate change and who's going to have to pay for it, for instance, and indeed who's going to be better off under, under climate change. And, <coughs> excuse me, there, there will be such groups of people who are, in fact, better off. So what I'd like to do in, in the brief time that I've got is just try and illustrate some of the ways in which climate change is an ethical problem and give some sort of response to the ways in which we can go about thinking about it in, in an ethical and, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully just way. And, and the two sorts of issues that I wanted to focus on was one that's very closely connected to the sorts of things that Kurt's talking about in the book, which is the issue of intergenerational justice. Um, as, as I think Aaron said, it, it's, um, it's very hard to get people to think uh, about problems in the here and now, let alone problems that are going to occur in, in 100,000 years or, or some greater time. Um, and one of the reasons it's so hard to get people to think about these things is because, well, the, the future doesn't exist. There are no moral agents uh, from the future among us now. So people. Uh, can't participate, they can't say what their interests are or what they'd like to do, and in, also there's obviously no uh, reciprocity. So even though it is very hard to think about um, moral problems that involve future generations, we, we can nonetheless, I think, uh, adopt a number of guidelines which we use to uh, address moral problems in other dimensions. And one of the things that I think we, we need to be able to um, say in our actions now is it's a kind of a, a negative duty we have, um, which is to think that, well, we shouldn't uh, inflict harms on people where it's relatively costly not to do so, uh, relatively uncostly not to do so. So we shouldn't harm future generations uh, if, if we can avoid it, for instance. That's one sort of thing that we can safely say that I think should guide our actions, even though we don't know what the future wants to some degree. I think we should also say more positively that um, it would be wrong of us not to do something that might help future generations where it, relatively speaking, doesn't cost us very much to do so. Now, it seems to me that these two principles are, are a reasonable sort of guide to our thinking about um, the future and some of these issues. And, and hopefully in discussion we might uh, talk about the ways in which they are actually principles that are useful in thinking about climate change. Um, because 
uh, my economist colleagues tell me, for instance, that even though adapting uh, and indeed mitigating all sorts of impacts of climate change is a very costly enterprise, relatively speaking, uh, it, it's a fairly small uh, margin of GDP for, for somewhere like Australia, for instance. So even though it's, it's a large number in absolute terms, in relative terms, it's, it's, it's reasonably small. Um, but I, I wanted to talk also about some issues in ethics and to do with justice that affect us uh, more in the here and now as well. Because we, of course, have the, the big issue of um, global justice in the sense that when countries meet to talk about who's going to bear the, the costs of adapting and mitigating to climate change, uh, as we've seen in, in Mexico and Copenhagen and everywhere, everywhere else, there's very little agreement on who should bear the, the burdens. And there's a number of ways of looking about looking at how we frame these issues about uh, distributive justice in the sense of bearing the costs and burdens of adapting and mitigating to climate change. And it's, um, it's unsurprising that you see uh, countries, for instance, like uh, China and India and so on, when they, they go into international negotiations, adopting a, a principle um, of what we, we call um, historical responsibility, for instance, which is um, the idea that if you have caused a problem, then you ought to be responsible for fixing its effects. Okay, this is very often the line that um, countries like China push. Uh, whereas other countries, um, very crudely, adopt uh, an alternative model, which is to say that those who have the ability to pay to fix some urgent problem, uh, such as climate change, ought to do so. It would be wrong for those who have the ability to pay um, not to try and do something in order to uh, head off the worst of the effects of climate change. And, and we roughly have these two models operating in the international arena. One, a historical way model saying, you broke it, you fix it. That is, Western countries typically um, have done the breaking, uh, and therefore they should do the fixing. And other countries that go for the position which says, well, um, if you have the ability, um, you know, because you're a relatively wealthy country, to do something about it, then you should do so. Um, there, if you like, the two sort of polar opposites for the sorts of uh, moral frameworks that countries and indeed people often adopt when they're talking about country, um, talking about how to distribute the benefits and, and burdens of climate change. And while I can't really go into it here, it seems to me that there are a lot more arguments in favour of uh, adopting the ability to pay approach, partly to do with the, um, the urgency of the problem. And to, to take a number of crude analogies, so very often, so if, if, if today that, um, you know, some of us have a drink after uh, the meeting and we go and injure ourselves in a, in a car accident, typically we say, well, uh, we'll give you free hospital treatment, even though you've done an idiotic thing. Uh, what is more important to do <coughs> in all sorts of urgent moral situations is bring people up, back up to a threshold uh, of well-being in, in some way. And, and so it is a lot of people, and indeed I would argue, uh, is the case with climate change. It's actually much more important to fix the problem than allocating um, praise and blame uh, in the way that uh, is often done. Um, that's a very controversial thing, obviously, and, and people might have um, comments about that. Um, and it's also very uh, important, I think, to understand whatever principle we choose for allocating benefits and burdens is one that doesn't leave the already greatly disadvantaged worst off. So, as I'm sure um, many of you know, the, the people <coughs> who are likely to um, bear the burdens of climate change are those people who are already badly off. In a global sense, you know, it's the people in, in Bangladesh and so on who are more likely to suffer than it is the people in the US um, or Australia. Um, so, hopefully, we would be able to get some sort of principle that didn't lead to the situation in which those people were made worse off. Um, and I think that's important to bear in mind, not only for international contexts, but for national ones as well. And I'd just like to end by making a few comments about um, climate justice, as it were, in the national context. Um, because you would hope that with any nation, even if it's a rich nation in Australia, we, we still do have um, large numbers of people who are quite badly off. Uh, a couple of million people under the poverty line, for instance, and you would hope that the impacts of whatever measures we choose uh, won't make them um, any worse off. 
And I just thought I'd, I'd try and um, bring out some of the moral issues in, involved in, in the national setting by just quickly closing with a couple of comments on um, carbon taxes, because it's the way we've chosen in Australia um, uh, to deal with, with some of the issues about climate change. Um, and I think what we have to do when we're asking ourselves about um, whether a carbon tax is, a, is a, uh, I think, a, a, an ethically justified way of dealing with some of the problems that we face, I, I think we have to ask, well, it, it's got to pass two tests at least. Um, one, one is a moral test, which I think can be summed up in the idea of well, whether it's fair or not. So it doesn't fall on the right people. Are some people paying it and other people won't? Um, for instance, it's much less likely in some ways to affect uh, agricultural communities um, because uh, they'll be left out of the carbon, carbon tax. Um, is the compensation being given to the right people, for instance? Uh, is it being, does it violate some principle that we think is designed to avoid uh, making the worst off uh, even worse off? So it has to pass a, a sort of fairness test, if you like, but it also has to pass an effectiveness. So, um, one thing about a, a carbon tax is it does um, rely to a great degree on the market to fix problems. So, you know, the idea is we tax carbon, people adjust their usage patterns, they use less carbon intensive things, um, and hopefully this will stimulate a, a green tech industry and so on. And, and we have to ask ourselves, will it actually do that, I suppose? So we have to ask ourselves these two questions. Is it fair um, and is it effective? And, and I think it's important that we have a, an ethical dimension in mind when we're answering those questions, in particular whether or not it will make the worst off um, any more worse off than they, they currently are. So in closing, I'd just like to say, well, I, I hope it's, um, people think that uh, it is important to have an ethical framework attached to one's response to, to climate change and not just sort of see it as, as an after effect. And hopefully such an ethical framework uh, will have the, the least advantage in mind.